I am Max, one of the co-founders of Graphsidian, and we're currently doing a few team interviews to introduce you to some of the great people that work here at the company. Now, my next guest is someone very special. It's actually my co-founder, Tim, our CEO here at Graphsidian. Tim is from Germany, from Berlin, and before co-founding Graphsidian, he worked for many, many years at Prisma, where he led their TypeScript efforts, efforts, and he's also the creator of the GraphQL playground. I'm really excited to chat with you today, Tim. What is your story? If you reflect back on your professional, professional journey, what were sort of the most important milestones in that? And specifically, what led you to found a company in the GraphQL space, right? It's the journey of a founder is, is a very different one from working at a company. What, what led you to want to found the company and what led you to the GraphQL space? Thanks, Max, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to, to talk in this different setting. Uh, from uh, I like this to have this different setting than from our all-day conversations, and I'm happy to uh, just explore a bit like these, these topics together today. Um, so that's a really that's an interesting question. <laughs> it's it's uh, what I could do now is get a bit give an overview, and then we can dive into topics that we that we find interesting. So I agree that founding a company is um, not common uh, still in this uh, society. I, I mean, in German society, I will immediately start with something harsh here. I think that uh, there is a certain sense of complacency uh, because we have a really um, we have this strong welfare in Germany. You you don't really need to do any risks or go into risks, and you can do very well. You there's no need to found a company. You can end up in a big corporation, um, could work for a car company, whatever is common uh, in, in, in Germany. Um, and yet I decided to go a very risky path that is also can be quite stressful. So I think where it comes from is when I was a child, when I was actually in uh, third grade, uh, I was uh, walking around with, with my friend uh, Timo back then and we we said oh, we want to be inventors one day and back in the days i had this idea of actually creating a perpetuo mobile which would take um, an led and around it put you put a solar panel and i thought that would produce energy i didn't know about uh, physics laws of physics back then so it obviously makes no sense um, and uh, realized that, uh, I mean, physics is, is exciting and uh, I enjoyed it in school, but you are bound to the physical laws. And if you, uh, architects and so on, you, you, you can do a lot of uh, exciting stuff, but you are just bound to the physical law. Whereas if you build software, you are usually not. You can build a lot of crazy stuff that you couldn't do in the physical world. So. I think that's that's what drew, drew me to software, and um, actually always kind of wanted to create a startup. Always want, had ideas, and had so many weird ideas on the way. One was um, Airbnb for food, uh, which I did back in the days uh, when I studied um, computer science in uh, Karlsruhe. Uh, the idea was that people could invite each other home, and then you would. Uh, cook spaghetti for a stranger, for example, uh, which we did like for one and a half years with uh, three people, but it turned out to be a, a fun idea, not a fun business to be in. Um, it's just uh, that uh, you, I learned that the um, hotel industry, for example, has this concept of variable prices, that when there's a conference in town, the prices of the hotel will go up. Uh, you don't have this concept for restaurants. Why? Because usually you have an abundance of restaurants and it's uh, really hard, even if, we, if you have a conference in town, that all restaurants are booked out. And so this kind of um, uh, demand uh, um, structure, you don't have that in, for, for food. And I think that was one reason it, it didn't work out. Also, uh, it's, um, many people said ah, it's much easier to just throw a mattress or an air mattress in my side room than uh, cooking for people and the concerns you have in terms of um, insurance and that's really tough and uh, especially in Germany that was uh, even in Berlin not really an option so we decided to stop doing it 
What we organized back then, which was really cool, was something we called uh, the, the, the walking dinner, where you had uh, three courses and you were cooking with a partner. And the first course, one course you were cooking yourself, maybe the um, appetizer. And then for main dish and dessert, you were going to other places in the neighborhood. So we had uh, even an algorithm where like, let's say in Karlsruhe, I think we had about a hundred teams that were signing up. And then the algorithm would uh, kind of find local clusters where you uh, and basically minimize the path that people have to walk while keeping another goal in mind, we wanted to mix things up. Uh, so that was, uh, it was interesting and that, that was really fun. I'm, I'm actually thinking of uh, doing such an event again in Berlin. The software is still laying around somewhere, built that back in the days with Angular and uh, MongoDB. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think since then I tried out many ideas and uh, a big learning for me was also that um, I needed to learn, listen to my, my gut feeling for these ideas and really deeply think them through. Sometimes I was just drawn in by these ideas and was like, oh, this is a cool idea and we won hackathons. For example, this, um, this uh, food idea, we wa actually won a hackathon. And uh, there was a guy in the jury and he said, um, well, um, and he was, he's like a multi, he's a millionaire and just had a really good deal before that weekend. Um, with a, a company called Supercell, he was an investor in them, and then he was like, "Okay." When we were done with the with the with the um, presentation, he was like, "Okay, how much do you want?" We were like, uh, "Nothing." I mean, we can just host this somewhere. We don't need money. <laughs> we, we we like that was an honest answer. Uh, later, it turned out that if you give these kind of answers to VCs or investors, that's exactly what they. Um, uh, what makes them more interested, but I literally wasn't, I was super like naive, like, uh, why money? I mean, we can just host this, this takes like 10 bucks a month to host this. Why would we need money? I don't know. So it was funny, but, um, and, and we actually worked on it full time for a while and won a um, prize to uh, be in an office of another cultural startup. And so I was um, uh, pausing the, um, the uh, my, my studies. Um, I'm I'm really grateful that that these kind of things are possible. So I was doing my uh, computer science uh, bachelor, and I knew I, I always like to differentiate in life between reversible and irreversible decisions. And that decision, although it has high consequences, was reversible. So if uh, it turns out that this is not a good business or we, it doesn't work out, I could always come back to university. And um, so we worked on it full time. We had investors that were interested. And just uh, uh, on the day we had a notary date, investment, everything was clear. We had everything negotiated, contracts, every do everything done. And the date of the notary, one investor didn't show up. And um, yeah, so, okay, we scheduled another, uh, yeah, we, we scheduled another um, uh, notary date. Um, and obviously you just don't get these notary dates that easily. So it took another two weeks or something. Uh, just before that, one investor actually came up with some really crazy ideas that are not founder, founder friendly. There are, and back then I needed to learn all of these uh, terms, there are things like um, as an investor you want to have down around protection. So that means if I'm raising around for 10 million now and then in the future because the business is not doing well I need to raise around for 5 million, they want their money to be protected obviously. And there are different um, ways to do this protection. One is called a weighted average. The other one, I don't even know the name anymore, but the other one would have been a full down round that they completely have the right to completely get the um, same, like for the same price that they put in, uh, then twice the shares, which can completely um, destroy the whole structure. And you normally do a weighted average. That means you just see how much is their percentage and then you calculate based on that um, uh, how, how that should be adjusted. And these kind of things I needed to learn and it turned out it was super tough and we needed to negotiate a lot. And um, just uh, a day before the second notary date, um, 
uh, an investor uh, came and wanted these crazy things and we were like sorry that doesn't work and uh, he thought that we were more desperate you know that we would accept this and we were like sorry but <laughs> we cannot accept this so third notary date and we had to postpone again and the third notary date um, uh, we finally agreed on okay terms uh, and just uh, the week and it was on a Tuesday and the, the just the Monday morning our supposed to be CEO he was also the most experienced from us he uh, worked in a um, consultancy for many years led engineering teams and that was when the investor said okay he's uh, experienced enough uh, let's let's do it he said sorry but I realized this is not really my thing food uh, I'm not really passionate about it I was super um, enthusiastic after our uh, event and all of this was super fast and cool but then when he um, when he reflected about it he was like no not really not really his thing and doesn't make sense that he works on it and so I was left with two uh, with one uh, co-founder and within a few hours we talked to the investors and they were like sorry but this is too risky for us you're not experienced enough goodbye yeah and that's how this first story ended Maybe even good because we might have spent a lot of time building something that uh, is not a good business and we afterwards still tried on our own but then realized okay no this this doesn't make uh, too much sense uh, yeah and that, that I think that was the first like more serious attempt to build a startup uh, and I still I was like okay good learnings let's move on like what's the next thing and and had many ideas afterwards for example in um, in university I had an idea, I called it Spoon Brain, uh, but the idea was something like Skillshare where um, both you can have videos that are recorded about certain topics, something like Udemy, but also just book a video session with a guitar teacher, for example. That was 2012 actually, uh, no, uh, 2014. Um, after this and um, then just uh, a few weeks in I was just starting to build a prototype Google actually launched such a product I'm not even sure if like this this good old sentence what if Google does it right it actually happened and I remember uh, in, in Karlsruhe they had a founder um, community really awesome uh, pioneer garage um, organized by students and um, I was just telling them the story and like it was like a little pitching competition and uh, said yeah well but Google does it now like yeah I need to do something else <laughs> like as a young founder if Google really puts in major efforts I think you're like okay no I, I will not do this I think after all, Google dropped the product I'm not aware that they have this product but while um, I think Skillshare still exists Right, like it's crazy when Google doesn't have, I don't know how many million users, they're like, oh, that's not, the market is too small. For us, a uh, good old story about the Google reader, right? So many people were sad that it got shut down. Um, but yeah, that was like the start. And then many, many more experiences that led to, to this point. Um, I think one big realization for me was really that I needed to start working on things that I would use myself that was important to me um, and I think it g gets you very far because you can with this intuition you can get very far you will still need to do product uh, product work and that's something I also realized at Craft CDN that I am not always the customer and that's really important to realize but um, I started going into dev tooling then and I was actually the first engineer at Prisma um, back then called GraphCool and because I was so passionate about uh, making building apps easier because I knew myself how annoying that is and how many concepts you have to learn how much stuff do you have to set up and uh, how much time that takes and you just want to try out ideas quickly right and so that's why I joined GraphCool back in the days which then had um, I, I would say two major pivots um, and uh, then as, as GraphQL moved away from, from, from GraphQL quite a lot and rather towards databases, I, uh, I realized that GraphQL is still such an underappreciated technology. Um, if you 
look at the whole market itself, like um, of course all the people using GraphQL, they love it and it's the awesome thing, but if you look at the actual uh, usage in the industry, it's not that high yet. It's not yet ubiquitous. It's not that if you start a project that you will for sure use GraphQL. Uh, within the, the GraphQL bubble, of course, but it's not for, for, for many people that's not the case. And I think there's still so much work to do to make it more accessible, to especially make it easy to run it in production. I mean, that's what we started with, with GraphCDN to uh, make the caching easy because the caching is um, it's not easy. And, and I, I think that we need to continuously raise the bar. Um, and so that is something that, that was an important realization for me to focus on things, on, on problems that I understand and that I uh, have myself. And with that, I believe to be able to create um, great products. Yeah. If I had to summarize everything you just told me in one sentence, I would probably summarize it as, I think you are a very creative person, right? I, you have all these ideas and you have a longing to create something, I think, um, a, a, a longing to, to put something out in the world and help people. And do you, does, does that resonate with you? Do you feel like you're a creative person? And, and if so, what role do you think does that play in founding a company? That's an interesting question. Um, I think that um, there, there's a scale between being, let's say, Picasso kind of creative. Um, and I think with that creativity comes sometimes a bit of uh, that you're like insanity as well. And maybe not being super, let's say, um, consistent. Uh, but you can have, um, I don't know why that is, but you, I think these people like more artist kind of person, persons, they can have an extreme, like, they like crazy ideas that I would never come up with. I think I'm rather in the middle that I'm not, uh, extremely creative. I think I need to be intentionally creative. It's not just that I walk around and the ideas are always coming and need to intentionally do it. If I intentionally do it, it comes. I can visualize things and think about the, those, those problems and be like, uh, uh, because and, and again, usually comes from me noticing problems that I have. Uh, for example, the, the spoon brain idea, I realized that I like to consume video content over books. So then I go on YouTube and a lot of it is pure trash. By now the YouTube uh, quality went up. And so I was like, hey, that's ridiculous. We need better quality. Um, and I think that is really a, um, a skill that I also tried to hone back in the days um, of how, how do you come up with a, with a good startup idea? You notice a problem, it's something that really annoys you, something where you, you're like, this is ridiculous. Why is it like this? Why can't it be better? We need to do something about it. And I think that's also part of my personality of kind of taking ownership of, over these things and like, let's do it. And um, the opposite would be maybe victimhood of kind of, oh, this is happening to me. I don't know what to do. Um, and so I know life is not always easy, but it's kind of, okay, let's do it. Like we need to do something about it. There needs to be a better solution. And also not, not, not everything is solvable. I, I, and, and, and some uh, things are maybe too crazy to, to, to tackle them yet. Uh, I'm, 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 I, I mean, I, I like what Elon Musk is doing by saying he goes to Mars and so on. But I wouldn't wake up and say, hey, that's ridiculous. Why are we just on one planet? We need to go to multiple planets. Like it, it has to be kind of relatable to me. And, and yeah, but uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe one day I wake up and say we need to do something crazy uh, like that. Yeah. I love that. Um, I think throughout all these experience from experiences from this Airbnb for food idea through uh, your other experiences and then Prisma and now GraphCDN. What, was there anything that you didn't expect to happen that happened where before you were like, I want to be a founder. And then maybe there was an unexpected side effect of being a founder, something that maybe nobody told you or warned you about. Was there anything that sticks out to you where you're like, I learned this, but it was, I would not have thought that that's the case. 
before going through all of these many different experiences? Yeah, so I think um, even before becoming a founder, one big realization for me was that it's okay to take your time. You don't need to rush into it. And that was my big realization with, um, with GraphQL and Prisma. In that moment, I really longed to be a founder. In that moment, uh, it was also a very hard time for me because I was building actually an um, AI painting app. And uh, we were starting, um, I think it was November uh, 2015 with it. And then in, Mar in April, in, in February, there was another app called Wizard. Uh, no, it was actually called Prisma. Uh, coming out and, and that app was extremely successful. It had the highest growth of any, any app uh, until that point. It was created by a very senior team, I think from Mail Russia or something, like they knew what they were doing, they were just crushing it. And we actually started working on it before them, but we were just slower, we were not that experienced. And that was really tough for me because uh, it was kind of, I could, no matter how hard I fight, I couldn't win. It's kind of running a marathon and you know you give everything, kind of your life depends on winning, but you can't win. And that was, that was really hard for me. Um, and then I also said, hey, maybe I don't need to found a company right now. I was basically realizing with the um, AI painting app, maybe I don't need to found something right now. Maybe I just collect some experience. And it's this uh, crazy sense of urgency and uh, maybe even fear that's kind of, oh, these good ideas, they are gone. Like, I need to work on them now, like the sense of urgency. Uh, and it was a really, really hard move for me to let go of that. And to say, even though I have certain ideas, back then I also had always ideas. Back then I wanted to create kind of a marketplace for algorithms and, and compute. Um, but uh, I was like, yeah, let's, let's just collect uh, uh, experience and I was recently uh, started uh, reading this uh, book Amp It Up from Frank, Frank Slotman and what he was saying is that it really highly depends not only on your personal skills but in which company you end up. If you end up in, in uh, Google, Facebook, some of these fan companies in the last 10 years, you will do very, very well, although maybe your output is average. But if you have um, excellent output and you ended up at IBM, whatever, um, and the companies haven't grown since then, then you will also not do that well. And I realized that um, it's, although I wanted to be the founder, um, it's, it's a better move to be an employee for a few years and uh, kind of let other people do the expensive mistakes and let me just learn and not being under this high pressure. Um, it was a bit tough for me because uh, in that moment, um, I think that being a founder, there can also be a lot of ego connected to it, and it's kind of I'm the uh, the one, the founder, and I like I don't want other people maybe to tell me what to do. But I realized, hey, again, if you wanna get influence, you need to give an elder's influence over you. Over you, if you wanna get respect, uh, you need to give respect to others and let them again like influence you and lead you if you wanna lead others and so on. And so the, the number one book that really in that moment was exactly what I needed was uh, Ego is the Enemy from Ryan Holiday. Um, because the number one problem was ego and why I was struggling with that move. And I was like, I was seeing some friends who were like, no, I will not um, uh, join a startup. I will do my own thing. And I was like, okay, but if you bet on the wrong horse and sometimes I... I, I, I thought that it would be the wrong horse and it turned out to be the wrong horse. And I was like, hey, I was not the um, founder, but I was at least in a rocket ship here and I learned tons of stuff and was really glad about the experience. And that gave me so much context, so much learning. And like, there were so many things that I learned and I'm, I'm really grateful for many learnings. One was, for example, when I came into the company, I did a lot of full stack development. Um, I didn't have the eye for the detail. Uh, I literally haven't trained my eye on it. And I remember back then, the, um, Johannes, the, the, the founder, he was basically teaching me, hey, this is not the, what the design is. And I was like, what are you talking about? I just implemented the design. And he just pointed out all these points and I didn't see it. I wasn't aware. 
and I just trained over and over my eye for it and now if there's like a pixel wrong it feels wrong and then I'm immediately pointing it out and like this sense for um, maybe perfection but also for um, aesthetics um, and also having really high standard and product and not uh, saying yeah this is good enough let's ship it but really no this doesn't feel right we need to improve I think that is one of the big things I learned really having these high standards and I think that's really important if you want to create a great product um, and it is something enjoyable for people and that's I'm proud of that that at GraphCD and we get this feedback from people oh, this feels great to use I could set it up easily and so on this is uh, what we are working for this is uh, shit tons of work uh, to get it done but uh, that is then very rewarding if you created something uh, that uh, was so high fidelity so polished that people just they love it and like this I, I have a fairly high standard for quality since then uh, which I didn't have before yeah. I think the quality piece is really interesting because often startups have an approach of you know just ship things as quickly as possible and just try and get something out there and test it and iterate and learn but often that leads to very low quality things right and actually i think that that quality bar i absolutely agree with you is often a prohibitor to people using it right they see the tool and maybe it even solves a problem that they have but if the quality isn't there then maybe they don't use it, right? And it's prohibiting your users from using the thing. But obviously it's also a trade-off, right? If, if you spend too much time making everything perfect, you're never gonna ship anything. And if you ship everything constantly, but you have it's no quality, then no one's also gonna use it, right? There's like a, a bar where the quality is high and high enough, but also you're, you're still providing value to your customers. And I think striving that balance is really difficult and it's definitely a learned skill. Um, and I think at GraphCDM we actually get that pretty well. Um, obviously, you know, sometimes it shifts in one direction or the other, but we do a really good job of shipping high quality things, but still providing a lot of value constantly to our users. In in terms of the, you know, working at a startup first, I that really deeply resonates with me. I learned so many things when I was at Gatsby and at GitHub. Um, and before that, I think well, I, I learned a ton of things through being an employee. And I think often founders that come into it fresh faced, never having worked at a company, never having been part of a rocket ship, they underestimate how much they have to learn, right? And I think if you go through that experience as an employee, you learn a lot of things. And, you know, we, as, as founders, we've, we've put a, we've, we've even codified this with the people that we're hiring now where we have this future founder promise. Do you maybe want to get into what the future founder promise is and, and, and what that means to you? Yes. Before I get into that, I want to quickly elaborate or leave a few thoughts around the balance between perfection and so on, because I just this is a very interesting topic to me. Um, modern product management is a very young discipline. It's only about 10 years old. Eric Ries with the Lean Startup kickstarted it. He had this idea of the build, measure, learn loops. He introduced that build something, measure, learn, and then you iterate. Um, there's quite some criticism coming around it. Um, one of them, one of the, the critics being Peter Thiel and saying, don't just do iterative stuff, uh, incre incremental stuff, but actually uh, do big changes. But there was a lot of important uh, stuff coming out of it. And I think there was a big misunderstanding what an MVP is. And actually, I would say that the modern version of the uh, Lean Startup book is uh, the book inspired from Marty Kagan which was also an eye-opener for me. And the um, point was really minimum viable. And the definition of viable is the main point here, right? The Marty Kagan also mentioned in the book, there are teams that are basically creating shit products, like it's unusable for any human. And they're like, that's not the point of an MVP. Uh, you want to have something that is actually viable and viable mean, means it's usable by a human. And the human might want to use it again right in the future and i think that was a big misunderstanding uh, of this culture of oh you spend time on making it nice oh that was a big mistake you should uh, focus on um, iterating whatever on on the uh, problem but i believe that uh, it is okay to do something that you also enjoy doing and this idea yeah if you're not um, 
if you're not embarrassed about it, then you did something wrong. To a certain degree, I, I, I agree with that. And I think you don't want to solve all the problems and you need to at some point say, yeah, we know these are the limitations. We'll get to that later. We first solved the main problems. Uh, but that was just a big learning for me when I was um, starting out and read the Lean Startup. There was a lot of misunderstanding around what an MVP is. And I think now we have a better understanding of that. And um, the other thing, one, one more thought I will leave here before going into the future founder promise is so-called two-track um, or dual-track development. And really this idea of uh, differentiating between discovery and delivery. That was like one of the biggest learnings for me. Um, the, I, I didn't even know about this differentiation. So the idea is that uh, in, in discovery, you're just trying to find out what even the problem is. Uh, and you try to find solutions for that. Uh, but you are completely open. You don't say, this is the solution. You say, I have this problem. This is my solution space. Let's try it out. And uh, the mistake, obviously, that companies did in the past and that Eric Ries wanted to address, and he did address it well, was that people, the companies directly jumped into uh, into delivery without spending enough time in this discovery. And I think that is something also very hard for engineers because an engineer has this fear, like the product managers tell the engineer, just do it quick and dirty. We are just trying it out. And uh, that's like discovery, right? And delivery is then, okay, now we deliver a production ready product. I think oftentimes engineers have this fear, uh, rightfully the fear, because it sometimes really, really happens well, I did it quick and dirty, and then we needed to keep that code and uh, ship it like that to production. And I think that is really an important differentiation for, for any product team, for any engineering org, really calling this out explicitly. I try to do that more explicitly on a daily basis and saying, hey, this is, an, this is a discovery task. We are writing a little spec here. We show it to users. We're not yet sure. We, are, we keep it in alpha. We, we uh, get the feedback. That's discovery. Delivery is then, okay, we know what we're doing. This is the thing. Let's build it production ready, well tested and so on. And I think it's important to differentiate those. Coming back to the future founder promise. Um, I think that the future founder promise, the, the idea behind that is really um, being upfront. So about, about certain topics. So as in, in a startup, you want people who have ideas you want people who who lead things you want people who are engaging who are drivers instead of passengers you want people who are going for it and um, in, in the early startup and you you as the company progresses you will need different personalities but in the beginning you want makers you want doers and usually those are the people who want to found companies as well um, it's actually also usually people who are good in product management are uh, people who could create uh, great companies because they learned how to uh, talk to customers and so on. That's usually what founders do in the beginning. Um, but the same as what I had back in the days with, with, with Prisma, uh, one thing is that you want to do a company. The other thing is actually having a good idea that makes sense. And that's not trivial. If you don't have a good idea, you shouldn't work on it. That's it. And this is sometimes a really harsh reality and people don't want to accept it and they're just looking for ideas and so on. But hey, it's also fine. Just, just lay back, maybe take a bit of time to find ideas and in the meantime, learn. And uh, as the um, most of the startups fail in the beginning, in the first few years, I think that's exactly the time you need to practice. Um, I believe that's way more useful than practicing in a big corporation because you haven't seen how the early days looked like. You will have all the resources already. You can just go to HR and say, I need this and that. That's not happening in a startup. You need to roll up your sleeves. You need to do it usually yourselves. You need to be a generalist even. And so you need, it's kind of a different persona you need. However, when you join a startup, um, let's say you have a... Um, founder that is not very empathetic with the people, they will say, well, I want to keep them as long as possible and I will not allow them kind of to, to leave. But uh, that's backwards. I mean, we know that people, the people that we hire in the beginning and that, that join a startup usually are the people, not all of them, 
but many are people who want to found a startup. So um, while I already knew at Prisma that this wouldn't be a problem and I always looked for side projects and so on, it wasn't clear and that was nothing, nothing, uh, nothing bad and, and, and I just brought it up. But in that moment you're, because you are in a, just by the nature of the situation in a, a situation, in an inferior situation, could theoretically be fired, right? Uh, in the worst case, it's uncomfortable to bring it up and to say, well, I work on a side project here and I might do this full time, I don't know. Bringing this up is super uncomfortable if this hasn't been mentioned up front. And uh, when I brought it up, it was the uh, Zern actually from Prisma was super supportive and he was like, let's go, I support you here. I was even surprised how supportive he was. But he also realized, you know, I cannot stop you. Like if you want to do this, you do this. Uh, the, 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 that doesn't make sense to kind of uh, try to prevent it. And uh, there are crazy uh, contracts that people have in terms of uh, intellectual property and protection there. And it's usually coming from investors. They want to uh, protect the inter intellectual property. And actually the uh, many um, contracts you have as an employee are completely illegal. They make no sense. They are sometimes like especially German employment law doesn't even allow the company to have any claim on IP that the, um, the, the employee had outside of the working hours. Um, that is actually something we then uh, checked with um, IP attorneys in Germany. And apparently it's different in other countries, but what I can say that in Germany, if you create IP, intellectual property as an employee outside of the working hours, it's definitely yours. The company can do nothing about it. And uh, that is uh, that was really great to see. It's it's very protective for the for the employee, and so I think that's why like we talked about this a lot, right, Max? When we got to know each other, you saw how I was basically suffering a bit in that situation just because of the uncertainty. You don't know how the pe how the person will react. You have a guess because you trust the person, but you don't know for sure because you haven't seen it. So I think we then realized, hey. How about we just make it clear up front? Because this is fine and we want to support people. We want to be there for them and we want to share the knowledge. And, and there are different ways how you can build a company. You can do it behind the curtain and you just talk with your team about the pure like daily business and everything investor relations, you can hide it. It's also valid uh, because you can see the investor relations as a distraction and you also don't want to overdo it. But there are certain things that you can uh, learn as an em employee, even though you haven't done the uh, the company building yourself or the at least the, the like founder activities yourself. You can learn a lot from seeing it and like the different approaches that the startup tried. Okay, this approach and project management didn't work. This one worked better, and so on. And I think that's really the beauty of joining as an early employee. You will just see a lot of things that worked and didn't work from your own experience. You will see how it feels as an employee. That's also really important um, uh, under certain leadership styles. Uh, and there is no perfect leadership style. All have disadvantages, disadvantages. But you will feel oh, always when, when they were like so whatever uh, directive and I couldn't even put in any opinion here. This doesn't feel nice. I want to include more the opinions of others or the other way around. Uh, they always included too many opinions and it was not clear. Uh, there wasn't any clarity. They should just have made decisions like there are different things you will observe and say, I want to make this better. And I think that's the beauty, this, this opportunity that you then uh, can have uh, to, to make things better, which then also is really tough. It's um, the, the realizations you have in the first weeks as a founder is like, oh my God, this is tough. This is not easy. And you need to learn so much. There are so many unknown unknowns that you don't even know yet that you don't know them. And you can, of course, read five books or something. But in the moment when you are not in the situation that this book is applicable, you will not really understand what this book is talking about. And I, I, I always wanted to read more of these like startup books. And I think it's good to get a common sense. There are some great books, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Um, and, and like the, the Lean Startup, these, these classics, I think they make total sense. 
But uh, what I also realized is you need to reread them if you once you're in the situation because you will suddenly completely different like you will understand that you will have a completely view different view on them and and have more uh, more context. So the uh, irony is that the being an early employee will definitely prepare you better than being in a big company in my opinion. Uh, but the best uh, learning still comes when you're actually the founder. Yeah. I love all of that. I think something I've realized over the last year, year and a half of doing GraphCity is that the company is ultimately defined really by the founder's values, right? Tim and I, uh, you and I were aligned on many points. And I think the, the point that really matters here is that we strongly believe in people first, right? We're building a company where we think the most important thing about GraphCidian is the people. If we can hire the best people and we can put them to work effectively and put them in a work environment that works for them, where they can do their best work, we will ultimately be successful, right? We will ultimately have success. And everything else flows from the people, which product we build, which customers we have, how successful we are, everything flows from the people. and. To us, it's also obvious that a lot of the really good people for the stage that we're at are people who might think about founding their own thing, right? Who might be like, look, I want to be a startup founder one day. And really, we want to encourage these people to come to GraphCDN, spend a few years learning everything that we can teach them. And internally, you know, we're super transparent, like you said, right? Like we try to share as much as we can legally. We, we just try to share as much as we can with the team and we default to open. And you can observe how we approach the company buildings, the successes and the failures we make, right? The decisions we make. And you can feel out for yourself really what worked and what doesn't. And that promise of us to you, you know, we're going to support you on your journey. We're going to teach you everything we know. And once you are in a position where you're like, look, I really want to go and found something now, we'll support you, right? We'll, we'll help you iron out your idea, we'll help you introduce you to investors and we'll just, we promise that we're going to help you be a founder in the future. And I think that was really important to, to me and to you, right? And it's, it's really important and I think it's ultimately going to make a big difference on GraphCity and success. Now, as a founder and as the CEO in particular, you have a million things to do every day, right? You have thousands of different priorities. There's so many things going on at any given moment. How do you stay productive? How do you prioritize? How do you figure out what you're doing every day uh, as you are very busy? Just as a, as a startup founder, you're just very busy. You have lots of things to do. How do you figure out what's the most important? How do you figure out what to work on? That's a very good question. We could probably talk about it for five hours. I try to give you like an overview of my system and then we can dive into uh, specifics. I will be honest that a year ago, uh, when we started the company, I was completely overwhelmed. Um, and uh, overwhelmed, being overwhelmed is more like a feeling, I would say. It's, um, it can also actually be you are not able to, to deal with what is uh, coming in, right? And, and I, I think that the amount of incoming things you need to deal with, uh, that is just uh, much higher than anything I had as an individual contributor before. Uh, I had my personal management systems where I just had a to-do list, maybe a notion or something, and I would just have like three columns, backlog today and done, something like that. And um, with that, I got pretty far. And usually in sprint planning, it's a very structured way you have like, Anything that really matters to me can, comes through the sprint planning. That's like the view from an individual contributor from an IC. And this completely changed, obviously, as a founder. Not only will you get a lot of stuff coming in, but you need to figure out what to do. You basically need to do your own sprint planning daily. You need to decide what's important. And that is very tough in the beginning when you have unknown unknowns. Um, you don't even know what should what to do. Uh, what's the most important thing right now? I don't know. And so that's that's tough. And I think that the biggest, the most important part here is really. I, I love the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Being a values-driven human versus a feelings-driven human. Feelings-driven means oh my god, I feel maybe anxiety or I feel this is super urgent. I do it, like kind of reactive because uh, I feel it and then I do it. Uh, and, the, uh, and you will get quite far with that actually, uh, depending on how well you do it. 
but what is way more pleasure like much nicer to do is actually being um, values driven and if you're values driven you can be proactive because you say well my value is to um, build great products or to to influence uh, positively influence people so from there you then think okay what can I do today to 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 achieve that and suddenly you are you like you have a strong yes and so you can say no to things and you're like mm, I understand that this is a request but sorry I cannot deal with it currently because I have this more important mission I think that is the most important thing really for self-management that you know what you want and with that you suddenly can say yes and no to things uh, it is clear that um, as a founder you need to learn saying no and again if you don't even know what your yes is you're not even you don't even know what to say no for uh, you will have investors coming all the time, VCs, and um, want to talk to you. Yeah? And if you are like, okay, well, I'm a founder, sounds good, let's talk to VCs all day, um, might distract you a lot and you don't know where things are going, right? And I think this self-introspection and this kind of clarity is the most important part. Um, there are great systems out there. I'm a big uh, fan of the getting things done method. The getting things done method is a very general framework and how you exactly do it is really on you. It's kind of learning to ride a bike. It's like there's, there are many ways to do it. And, and um, I, I think I started with the getting things done method now a few months ago. And I will really say it changed my life. Uh, and actually a book that I highly recommend is called, uh, it, it is a bit of a cheesy title, but The Great CEO Within. It's a very practical book and uh, they had a great chapter around productivity. And so the idea was really that you kind of can see it as um, triaging in the hospital. If you have cases coming in, you need to always quickly triage. If there's someone nearly dying, you cannot just ignore that person. Um, and you always need to immediately triage, but maybe sometimes you say, I delegate this. I give it to this department or I, uh, I say this is not important today, it's important but not urgent. And like this idea of um, quickly triaging things. So and the funny thing is that um, I observed that many people have an um, obsession about tools. What tool is it? What is the magic tool you're using kind of? Um, and I think the tool doesn't matter actually. There are for sure tools that make life much easier. Um, but it's kind of this idea, and that's again an idea of the Getting Things Done book. Um, a great carpenter wants to have a great hammer, of course. They want great tools. If they're doing this daily, they will choose high quality tools to do their job. But if they don't have a great hammer at hand, they will still be able to do a really great job with a bad hammer and with, with the bad tools. Um, however, if you're, not, uh, if you're not a trained carpenter, you can have the best hammer of the world. You will not be able to use that thing. And that's exactly the same with to-do systems. Uh, you can have the best to-do system uh, of the world. If you don't even know what you're doing there, this will not help you. So, uh, and, and it is a topic, it's such a complex, heavy topic uh, that I believe you need to study this. You need to look into this. There are a few um, great blog posts you can read around it, but it's kind of saying, I want to master life and I will read one blog post and that tells me how life works. That's, that's not how it works. You need to constantly iterate, constantly try things out, things that are for you. There are people who um, iterate on, on their approaches and they. I also tried out a bunch of tools until I found something that works for me, that is scalable for me. Um, I personally actually ended up at a, with an app called Things uh, to, to manage my to-dos um, and the idea is that and that's also part of this getting things done workflow. You, as soon as you have an idea or you're in a meeting and you have a to-do that comes up, you immediately put it in your inbox. You, don't, you just put in a few keywords, nothing special. It's really, for you know what the context is and it's your own thing. And then every morning you go through this inbox and you triage it, unless it's obviously urgent and you will know if it's urgent, so you will deal with it. And so every morning go through it and say, okay, these things I need to deal with today, these things I would like to, but I'm not sure if I will get to them. And so you, you, you categorize them differently. 
actually uh, in things my latest iteration with the system is that everything I really need to do I only put that in the today uh, um, section and anything that I would like to get uh, to but I'm not sure comes into any time anything else comes to uh, to sometimes the categorization and things because if you put anything that you could kind of do today into the today section you will always fail you will never achieve it it's impossible uh, you, you will never finish kind of your to-dos. That's why it's so crucial to differentiate between the absolute musts and the I would like to. And uh, if you just put the musts in the to-do section and you will get, get them done more often, you will feel better about it. You feel like, okay, this I got done. I, I am productive about it. Um, and I think really this um, asking yourself que the hard questions, that's something you need to practice. And what, like, I think the quality of your questions determine the quality of your life. And uh, one of the questions is really, what can I do? What's the most important thing for me to do today? And really uh, sitting down maybe for 10, 15 minutes, or what is the most important thing to do this week? And really thinking about it, maybe staring against the wall or the window or whatever, comparing a few things in your mind. Some people, for some people, that's absolutely clear. Like uh, in, in some, for some people, like, I, I sometimes need to think about it a bit. Okay, these things. And basically, in, in computer science, there's this algorithm called bubble sort. And what you do, you're comparing two elements in, an, in, a, in a list with each other. And you will at some point find out what is the, like, the order. And that's the same thing you can do with, with priorities. You just say, is this thing more important than this? You just look at these two things and you say, well, this thing is more important. You again take the next thing. What is more important and so on. And with that method, you can fairly quickly in a few minutes come up what is really the most important thing to work on. Um, and then I'm, uh, I'm also a big fan of simplicity, of course. And we now don't want to have a too crazy system and I need to uh, have crazy workflows here and I think after all uh, the uh, overarching theme in such a system still needs to be what is the one most number one most important thing you want to do this week and today and that will change every day that will change every week um, because you are not able to do two things um, to perfection or to like really high quality you can only do one thing really well. That's just reality. It's, 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 it's hard to, to accept because there are so many uh, things. Um, and uh, for me, that was actually recently a realization that we need to hire an engineering manager. Uh, and now I'm every day asking myself, what can I do today to move this forward? Maybe create a better a careers page or reach out to more candidates and so on. And then every day, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, at least today I move that one number one thing forward. It's okay. So many things happen, had many calls. It's okay. But I did a little bit at least to move it forward every day. And I think with that, you can be way more proactive. You are owning your, uh, your time. And with that, I, I believe you can also be way more effective. And the thing is that um, as the, the other important part is, I mean, if we're talking about getting things done and so on, we, I cannot not talk about the manager versus uh, maker schedule. And the idea is that, this is a famous article from Paul Graham, uh, founder of y, y Combinator, that um, if you want to do deep work, then you will it will take a while for you to actually get kind of load all the context into your RAM, into your mind. And uh, that means you, if you have an interruption, you again need to uh, load all of this kind of into your brain cache if you want to. And that's why, let's say you have an eight hour block and you have just two meetings spread in the middle of that, like 15 minute meetings even, that sucks. Because in that moment, you cannot just fully dive in and like tunnel you always you already need to know ah yeah there there's this other meeting already busy in your mind with that uh, whereas uh, in business usually um, as an exec oftentimes you have many quick tasks you need to answer to many emails you have a quick call here and you need to have a quick conversation uh, and so on it's like this these more like quicker smaller tasks it's more like the manager schedule and so 
Um, it's important to give yourself both. You need both. You cannot just do one of them. That just doesn't work. You will have a lot of small tasks as a founder and you just want to get them done quickly. You want to batch them together because that's kind of this, you're in this mode of quickly responding. Let me go through the emails, the, the notifications, uh, and respond, maybe write some messages and so on. But you will need deep work. Like I, I believe uh, in that, in deep work and big fan of Cal Newport's uh, work and also his, his uh, podcast, really awesome. Um, highly recommend the book, Deep Work. And um, for me personally, uh, if possible, I like to do deep work in the morning. Um, it works quite well currently because I'm in Europe and we have some part of the team is in the US and then it's easier to like have your focus time in the morning. And uh, it's a big recommendation from the CEO within and I try to uh, follow that and sin since then, like this is a big game changer for me, having two hours a day of focus time that you really schedule in your calendar so that you don't have accidental uh, events in that time. Again, if you have this little 15 minute uh, call within these two hours, it's so annoying. You cannot really dive in, right? And that's, that's just how our brains work and we need to accept that and just uh, embrace that and not, not, not fight that. Uh, there's this saying, resistance is suffering. So I, like, since I have these two hour um, focus times in the morning, this helps me so much. And what that really helps with is I can have like about 15 minutes I need to like go through the to-dos of the week and you're actually every day reviewing all your to-dos of the week because um, that's why you put them in the week to do like it's, it's actually there's something to do here. Uh, you will not review all the someday um, to-dos that you might want to do at, at, at some point but the, the, daily to -do, uh, the, the weekly to-dos you should review daily. It sounds a bit extreme, but that is really necessary to, to, to stay with these things. And actually, the, the, I think the biggest weakness of most to-do systems is that you're doing the urgent stuff, but not the important stuff. That's, that's I think, the main, um, the, the main issue. Um, and by the way, a simple saying that, that can completely summarize all productivity uh, literature is putting first things first. Meaning if I know this thing is the most important if, and you actually do it then, you already did everything right. That's it. That's the whole thing you need to do. Whatever system you do, if you realize this is the most important thing and you actually do it, great, you're done. And, and, and I think uh, like this, it's a really simple idea and whatever system that gets you there, it's fine. Like, it doesn't need to be complicated. If, it's, if you don't need a complicated system, it's great. Um, and I think the, the, the irony is that we are sometimes in the illusion that we don't need to do the first thing first. And then we don't do it and then it has negative consequences. So it has consequences anyway, what we do. And now we can, we, we, it's our choice, what, what we want to do. Do we want to do the things that have the negative consequences or the positive consequences? And of course, uh, I think the main point why certain people are successful and others not is that they are pushing themselves to do the things that they should do, but they're not comfortable. How can you get there? Again, with a strong value system, with a strong yes. You're like, ah, I really don't want to do this, but you know what? This is actually what I need to do. And then you do it. And again, I think that's why values on a personal level, but also company level, team level are so important because you know, well, uh, we need to invest into this topic because we said this is important to us. I know this takes time now and we would like to do other things, but we need to do it now. And again, it all, uh, basically comes back to the values. There's one more uh, like insight that I want to tell here from the getting things done uh, uh, method, which is the weekly review. I think the biggest, uh, the, one of the biggest reasons to-do systems are failing for people is that they are not uh, spending enough time in the review phase. And I know it takes a lot of time and that you need some discipline for that. but. I like this idea, so um, David Allen was talking about this situation. Imagine you're going on vacation and just a week before you will damn make sure that your uh, to-do list is empty. You will make sure that everything is taken care of, delegated, that everyone knows everything and so on, so that you have the peace of mind. That if you are on vacation, you're not like, oh my God, this other task did I think about it. You want to be, you want to relax. That's why you go on vacation. 
and it's kind of this like cleanup. You go through everything, you make sure everything is clean. And uh, this mode of like cleaning these things up, making sure everything is taken care of, that's what you should do uh, weekly. And this is obviously something that takes more than 15 minutes going through all the to-dos. It can take half an hour, maybe depending on the size of your of, of the, uh, the, the to-dos, it could be uh, one hour. But this, this was this, this beautiful idea that I learned there, which was uh, this idea of I clean things up like I do for vacation. And I think everyone knows this mode. It can be a bit stressful because, oh my God, I have all these things that I need to take care of. But that's exactly what you need to do on a weekly basis to clean things up, to make sure uh, things are taken care of. And the more often you do it, the less stressful it will be, of course. Like, it's like uh, if you have a very tidy house and just a little bit untidy, tidying that up is easy. But if you didn't tidy up your house for half a year, <laughs> you will probably spend weeks to get it uh, in a good state and the same here. Yeah. I love all of this. I think what really resonated with me as well is going back to the values piece. Um, you know, I, early on we talked about sort of the people first value and how things flow from that. I think another really big value that you personally have and that we share and, and have also brought into the company is the value of, or I, I don't know how to phrase this, but we really value learning. We re really value growing, right? We don't have a lot of ego. We're not like, we have everything figured out. We're, we're, we're Jesus and we know the answers to everything. It's like, no, we come with a humility and we come with the, the curiosity and wanting to learn, right? We also know what we know. We're confident in our, in our skills, but also so much of what we do is just having to improve, right? And, you know, all of these really important lessons you're learning about your own personal productivity, they come from a place of curiosity, from how to be better, how, how can I learn to grow, how can I be more productive, how can I be more effective in my job, because you have so many things to do that you just got to figure out, okay, how can I do my job better, how can I do this better, and I think, you know, people often, when, when they interview or, or we talk to them, they ask us questions like, you know, what is your parental leave policy, what is your vacation policy, or what is your policy on employee development, right? And to me, I can answer all those questions, of course, and they all have very specific answers, but really the higher level answer is just, you know, we put people first and we really value learning. And to give you an example, right, in the, in the putting people first, our parental leave policy is that everybody, no matter which gender and why you got a new member of your family, whether that's because it was born or adopted or whatever reason, get 16 weeks of parental leave. Doesn't matter what gender you have, doesn't matter why, it's just 16, leaves, uh, 16 weeks of leave. Because we believe that that is the right thing to do so you can get that new person, that new human set up in the world and in your family. And equally on the sort of learning piece, right, we recently introduced that everyone at Graph City and every employee gets coaching. And that's really unusual. Usually coaching is only something that's reserved for the executive team, right? The executive team, everybody has their coach and they're, they're getting better, but the rest of the company is just sort of doing their job, right? And we don't see it that way, right? We want everybody at Graph City to be a leader and we want everyone to get better. We want everyone to have the opportunity to get better if they want to. And so we recently introduced that everybody gets coaching, but, and you know, people can ask about those things and I can give those specific answers, but I, to me, it's always, like you said, it always goes back to the values, right? To me, it just always goes back to putting people first and valuing growth, valuing learning. and. I think that's something beautiful that you, you've really brought into the company, Tim, because you personally are so, uh, so focused on just growing and learning. And I, I absolutely love that. Thank you. Yeah, so that's, it's a really, really interesting topic because first of all, if you read business books, they're very, let's say, focused on the market, focused on finance and so on. But and on maybe the ideas, but and and it's it sounds so dehumanizing. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, this is just a group of people, and and this the simple idea. I, I, it should be clear to everyone, but it, it isn't being said enough. It's just a comp a company is a group of people. Like always, like the the company is just being spoken about as this big uh, thing, like the company, like and this like you have a brand, right? Like Apple. But what is Apple? Apple is a collection of humans, that's it. And they have some <laughs> nice logos and they are able to, uh, they are able to pro produce really great products. But it's a collection of humans. It's all the humans, right? I mean, currently, let's see when the robots are taking over. But uh, I agree with that. And it's also 
Um, I, I still believe that also the, the organization itself needs to have a purpose that's kind of over the um, individual uh, uh, goals, right? And uh, saying that we want to provide value to the customers, uh, which is again also something that can tie back to personal values, which is doing something good for others. Um, and you know, an interesting uh, point here is that uh, like like this idea of com combining, like uh, sometimes it feels like an either or to people. Either you take care of your people or you build a good business kind of. And I think that um, there is of, co of course a balance to be found. Like you cannot just coach people 24 seven. Like we need to actually get work done, right? But uh, on the other hand, um, it is possible to do meaningful things for the team that, are, that make a lot of sense, that are uh, not taking too much time and that just that makes everyone uh, taken care of, that, that, that uh, work very really well with the mission and that work very really well with the interest of the company. Uh, if we, for example, have the, the mentoring or the coaching, it takes, I think, one, two hours per week, that's nothing. Like, if you really think about it, I think we calculated it and um, it's costing us for about 10 people roughly the salary of one person. So it's like 10% uh, or it's basically one person that we are kind of paying there, right? But if you think about it, adding one per what is more meaningful? Um, adding one person to the team or even just leveling people up by a few percent. Of course, leveling people up because it's kind of a... Um, it's like an upward spiral because okay this one person got in this one particular skill they got better in maybe um, conflict resolution or uh, talking about difficult topics and maybe that was the deciding skill that got us to uh, realizing and making certain decisions and those decisions had again the big impact and so on like the, I see this can have such a it's like this ripple effect right uh, you had this one learning and then it can also have a really positive impact on others. You might have realized, hey, it's more important to work on clarity. And then the team suddenly realized, oh my God, it's also our job to, to, to get the clarity. And suddenly you have this like ripple effect and, and, and this beautiful uh, development out there. Uh, and yes, so I think, and, and that is actually, again, coming back to the beginning when I mentioned uh, uh, like the, the traditional German uh, um, corporate culture, uh, you having coaching for every human this is crazy if, if I tell this to to friends and and, and family there what how, how can you afford this like how is this even possible and maybe once a year uh, uh, people have like a leadership seminar or something right if they if they're lucky uh, and that's it but having actually a coach that is there for you and can give you individual coaching I think that makes so much sense um, and to be fair it's also still an experiment we do it for a few months now so far, I think people are getting a lot of value out of it. I uh, got a lot of value out of it. One of our um, uh, early investors, Andreas Klinger, he, that was the first, one of the first things he was saying, you need to get coaching. And in that moment, you might think like, okay, what am I doing wrong? Like, like oh, oh, what, oh, what does he mean? And it's like, literally, it doesn't matter who you are, you need coaching. That, that's kind of the idea. And then, and, and then uh, the, the, I think the, it's important to not get into this trap of, oh my God, am I bad or am I inappropriate? I need to get fixed with coaching? No. It's like, you are awesome, you are enough, but you, uh, we can all still level up, we can still learn, right? And holding this um, uh, kind of uh, dichotomy in your, in, in your head, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, a, it's a, um, a paradox, kind of. Um, and uh, there is, I think it's even called the Stockdale Paradox, which came from a captain in the, um, in, I don't know in which war it was, but he was at the same time uh, imprisoned. But also he um, had this certainty, he knew, I will get out here. And having this extreme certainty while being in a super tough situation, that's like the paradox you also need uh, as a founder because you know things are not yet doing that well. Like we're not yet the trillion dollar company, but we, you also need to be like faithful that you get there. So you cannot just ignore the problems. You cannot just ignore whatever. If you have churn and, and customers running away, 
you cannot just ignore that. You need to look it in the eye, but you still need to be super like faithful and like energetic about what you're doing. How can you achieve that? I believe the answer to that is gratitude. Because like I think gratitude is kind of this uh, se secret superpower, this like infinite source of energy. Um, and it's something you need to practice. Uh, if you haven't practiced gratitude, it's in the beginning it feels a bit awkward, weird, like, yeah, I'm thankful for living, okay. But after a while you're like, actually like, oh my God, I'm so privileged, we can do so many things. We have, we are serving so many awesome customers. We're actually solving a problem for them. We are, we are learning from them. We are having these great conversations. We are working with this awesome team of people. And just coming from there, is such a beautiful mindset then you're suddenly hey it's easy let's let's like i know that it's not all perfect but we're getting there and i think that gratitude that is kind of a that's a, such an important uh, concept that um is super underappreciated in the in the company sense i think in, in the in the personal um, self-help world that's a very common concept like be grateful and maybe have a journal in the evening you write the three things down you're grateful for but again i think it's a really powerful tool uh, for business actually i agree i think you know one of the one of my favorite things that we've introduced is a gratitude section after some of our meetings we just do a quick gratitude session, right? And everybody says something that they're grateful for. And it's been a beautiful way to connect with the team and to, to, to connect with all the other people at Grassian, right? Like we said, the company is really just a collection of individuals. And I found that to be a very beautiful way to connect with all of these people. Now, Tim, I, I think there's like so many threads that we could keep pulling on for an hour. So I look forward to the next conversation, but I think we're gonna end it here. And dear listener, I'm gonna say one more quick thing before you head out. We are hiring across the board. If any of this resonated with you, if you feel like, oh man, I wanna, I wanna check out this company, maybe I wanna work here, maybe, maybe you're a future founder, right? Maybe you wanna found something in the future, but future, but you wanna learn a little bit more. Maybe our values resonated with you. If that's the case, we're hiring literally across all departments. Whether you're a designer, an engineer, a marketing person, an ops person, a recruiter, doesn't matter. Just reach out, right? If you go to graphcityn.io/careers, there's some positions on there already. There's many more coming. Even if there isn't a role on there that fits you perfectly, but you feel like you really wanna, you really wanna explore this opportunity, just ping us, right? Feel free to ping Tim or me directly, Tim at Crassidian.io or Max at Crassidian.io. Just write us, let us know what you can do, how you think you could contribute with your skills and be a part of your team. And if it's not the right time, it's not the right time, but then we already know you exist. And then when it's the right time for us, we can just ping you and be like, look, now this role just opened up. Let's have a conversation about this, right? And um, so if, if, if any of this resonated with you, if you think this is interesting or you know anybody else that you think this could be interesting for, just reach out, right? Hit us up, let us know. We would love to hear from you. Uh, like we said, right, the most important thing for the company is the people. Uh, we have to find the best people and we're, it's, it's ultimately the thing that will make Craft City successful. And so we really want to hear from you. And if you, if you think that, that any of this sounded interesting, just reach out. Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me for now over an hour. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a while. It's so many interesting things that I just want to keep pulling. So I, I can't wait to have another conversation about all of this. Uh, thank you for joining and uh, I'll see you all in the next team interview. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs>